And okay, so um, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Mary Lesser, and today we're going to be talking about sports nutrition for young athletes. So a little bit about myself here. Okay, we need to click on it. Yep, maybe. See if we can advance the slide here. Okay, all right. So a little bit about myself. I can get my clicker to work. There we go. Okay. So um, my background is obviously in nutrition. I have studied nutrition and been participating in this field for the last 14 or so years, which seems like a very long time. Um, I wear a couple different hats here at the hospital. I work with two main services. I work um, not only as part of the sports medicine program, running the sports nutrition program specifically, but I also work in the main children's hospital at the Oakland campus, working with what we like to call the HOT team or the hematology oncology transplant team. So I do have an inpatient um, position as well. Um, in addition to that, I'm actually on faculty in the Department of Nutritional Sciences and Toxicology at UC Berkeley, and I also um, independently conduct research as a postdoctoral researcher at Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute. My research focuses in nutrition and pregnancy. Um, so a lot of different areas of nutrition. I do enjoy it, um, but I really do enjoy working with my young athletes here, and hence why I'm going to be speaking tonight on sports nutrition. So I do have an independent clinic that I do run for sports nutrition. Um, I have one here in Oakland as well as the Walnut Creek campus. So the Oakland campus is the first Friday afternoon of each month. And the Walnut Creek campus is the last Friday afternoon of each month that I will independently see athletes and work one-on-one -on, -one on eating plans with them. All right, so what are our objectives of tonight's talk? Well, tonight we're really going to focus on what specific foods fuel bodies during activity and at rest. So I'm a foods person, so yes, I talk about a lot with nutrients and nutrition, but I really want the take-home message to be what foods um, kids need in terms of fueling their bodies for the different activities that they'll be per, uh, participating in. Um, the next thing is that I'm going to be discussing when to eat before and after physical activity and the importance of hydration for these activities as well, particularly because we live in very different microclimates in the Bay Area, going just through the tunnel into the Walnut Creek, even further outside, and where I grew up in Lake Rockland, it gets very, very hot in different areas, so making sure we are properly hydrating and also making sure that we're not overly hydrating and talking about different methods of hydration. Okay? And also timing of meals is very key in terms of what types of activities we're going to be participating in. And then just in general, getting a common sense sports nutrition feel and tips for the young athlete. So a little bit of background on youth athletics in general. Um, this is actually a fairly new area and there seemed to be quite an increase in popularity um, and participation over the last probably 15 to 20 years. Um, at this point in time, the last number I read, there's about 38 million children that participate in some sort of athletic endeavor in the United States. Um, there was actually quite an increase, let's see the last numbers I got, where there was such an increase in between the years of 1998 and 2007, there was just about a 10, or excuse me, 9% increase in the ages of participation. So between seven and 17 years, you saw a big jump in participation of sports. Um, what is different though between adults and kids is that we have to take into consideration during this time, you know, between the ages of let's say like, you know, you start participating in sports around five, six years of age up through high school is you have rapid growth going on, okay? So not all of our muscles and everything are um, at the same uh, strength and tone as what you would see in an adult. So these are things that I have to keep in the back of my mind when I'm working with my athletes in terms of what to provide for them for nutrition. So the big things are going to be one, your substrate utilization. So what this pertains to is what food or food components are being used for fuel. So a lot of times that comes down to, for kids particularly, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Okay? Also, like I mentioned, growth needs. There's a lot of rapid growth going on. So when you talk about like specific needs for kids versus adults, sometimes the needs seem like they're a bit higher based on the fact that we are supporting that growth taking on during these phases, particularly, of course, during puberty where you see that rapid spurt of growth um, occurring. The other thing is that kids have overall lower muscle strength and tone. And so this is something I have to keep in mind in terms of not only replacing needs, but also um, muscle fiber growth and um, the fact that there's 
a lower capacity for anaerobic um, capacity so that those are the B activities that would be without requiring oxygen. We're going to get into some of that in a little bit, but just some things to keep in the back of your mind in terms of what the differences are between adults and kids. Because one of the biggest challenges is that most of the sports nutrition research that's out there is really primarily conducted on adults and kids that are of the higher age or more highly competitive athletes. So like your like late high school, early college, maybe you're 17, 18 years old. So a lot of times the things are extrapolated into kids. So working one-on-one -on -one ends up being much more like, not necessarily trial and error, but you know, working one-on-one -on -one and where they're at with what they're doing and if there's any specific food preferences and such. All right, so what are our top challenges for the young athlete and what are the things that I most commonly work on with um, my kiddos when they're in clinic? Number one, a demanding schedule. And not just a demanding athletic schedule, but a demanding school schedule. Um, if they're you know, very active in like church or like other groups, okay, like uh, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. Okay, so being able to balance the schedule and timing that with being able to eat properly. Incredible intensity, so depending on the sport that they're participating in. Okay, if there's also repeated practices and competitions, being able to know when to fuel to be able to provide for all of those things. Um, also, performance demands not only in... Um, uh, our sports, but also for school performance and making sure not only that we're eating enough for athletic performance, but also eating enough day to day to get through school and be able to have them perform well academically. And then again, just really taking a look at our food and fluids and putting them to work for training and competition, depending on the sport, depending on the age, depending on, you know, the schedule of each individual athlete. All right, so my top nutrition concerns that we're going to talk about this evening and what I work on with my athletes are going to be calorie needs. And not that anybody is going to be an unquote unquote diet, but calories are energy. And to be able to fuel these activities for athletics, you need to be able to have enough energy on board. And that is going to be in the form of calories. So we're going to talk about the different components of nutrition that are going to provide those calories. And then again, what those food sources are. Okay. So then we're going to talk about the training diet. And again, not everybody is on a diet per se, but it basically taking a look at the type of activity and the different you know, components of nutrition and foods that are going to fuel for that specific activity. Okay. And we'll talk about some timing, pre-practice, and game eating. What's the best time to eat? What's the best types of food to eat? Depending on what those activities are and how far out before we are participating in those activities. Fluids is a big one. I get a lot of questions about should my child be drinking sports drinks or is water just fine? You know, should I be doing those special like high protein drinks after I'm working out or is water just fine? And then we'll talk about specifically post-workout eating and some of those things that should be included in that diet and what timing, um, what timing is important in terms of that as well. Okay, so what we're going to be touching on specifically today. So we're going to talk about our training diet basics those components that are going to provide the majority of energy. So again, I want you guys to be thinking food sources. Thank you. Hello to everybody who's coming in right now. Welcome. You guys haven't missed anything, so you can jump right in. Um, uh, we're going to talk about pregame eating, hydration strategies for the young athlete, as well as some ideas for recovery foods. All right, so first we're going to take a step back, and we're going to take a look at what actually happens when you're physically active. So for those of you in my live audience, what happens when you're physically active? What, what goes on in your body, you think? Use energy. You use energy, exactly. And do you know where that energy comes from? Glucose. Glucose, OK. Yeah. Fat. And some protein, and, not much. And some protein, not much. Oh, you're all over this. Awesome. OK. <laughs> that is amazing. OK, so you know. don't worry. No one needs to uh, memorize this by any means. This is kind of a good, like, you know, capture of what goes on in terms of energy and where we get that energy from. So exactly like, what, what's your name? Carter. Carter. Exactly like Carter said, you're going to get energy from three main components of the diet. Glucose, also known as the basic building block of carbohydrates. And as carbohydrates are stored, they're stored as glycogen. Okay? And those are going to break down into these nice glucose molecules, and you're going to get energy from these. So you get this pal, pal energy. And what's interesting with glucose is that you can get energy in two different forms. You can get it without oxygen, okay, so anaerobic activities, and you can get it with oxygen, so uh, the aerobic activities. And again, I'm going to have you start keeping this in the back of your mind because some activities are much more anaerobic. Other activities are much more aerobic. So thinking about where those uh, food sources come from to get those. 
Um, also, we have this nice storage bank of fat, so triglycerides is what TG stands for, fatty acids, and you're going to be able to get um, lots of energy from our fat stores. But you can see here that you don't get oxygen, you, you can't get anaerobic activity because we can't go here and then backwards, you know, that arrow only goes one direction. So when you go through, um, you know, fat breakdown to get energy, it's only through an anaerobic process. And if anybody remembers like high school biology or even college biology, if you're there or past there yet, do you guys remember what that process is called when you go through using fat? It's called beta oxidation. I don't need to remember that now, but sometimes that helps me remember that um, when you use fat, it's going through a process that requires oxygen. Okay? And then finally, yeah, so we do have protein, and protein you can break down to get a little energy as well, as you can see. Um, protein, though, is very interesting because a lot of times we're just using it to replace anything that we've lost or broken down during activities or even just day to day. Okay, so, and the thing with protein, too, is that we don't actually store protein. So by eating more protein, we're not going to have a storage bank as we would with necessarily with fat as well as glycogen. We're going to basically have this bucket that's constantly turning over of what we need, what we don't need. So that excess is going to either go to immediate energy needs um, or it's going to be converted and stored as fat. And then one of the things also with protein is we want to make sure that um, uh, our kidneys are working properly to be able to um, excrete the nitrogen part of protein because that can be toxic to our bodies. And that's something that comes up later on when I get these questions of, you know, um, should I be taking these heavy supplements and such like that? And so we'll talk about that later on. Any questions so far about kind of where our energy is coming from? You guys are good? All right. All right. So going back now to thinking about types of activity and where our energy is coming from. So this breaks down where your energy is coming from for short, longer, and longer duration activity. So you can see up here for fast, short, like zero to three seconds, so a sprint start, you're actually going to get all of your energy from your storage bank of ATP or adenosine triphosphate or the creatine phosphate, okay? and that is just stored. Um, and that's not even coming into our carbohydrate, fat, or even a little bit of um, protein store. So that's going to be what's right away, you know, apparent in your body. Okay? But as you can you can see, three we got three seconds of that. Okay, so we we burn through that, start to burn through that very quickly. All right, so then we start thinking about other activities here, things lasting more like 10 to 12 seconds. You start to see, because we are going to burn through that ATP pretty quick, that's when we start utilizing some of our other um, energy sources like carbohydrate. You see as we start to progress on, four to six minutes, we're primarily using carbohydrate, moving on to, you know, a 10K race, um, you know, more carbohydrate only. And then as you start to get more and more, into your longer endurance runs, you're gonna to start to see that you're gonna start using fat as your fuel source. One of the things that's different between adults versus kids though, so this is a very nice adult profile. For kids, um, and I shouldn't just say kids, um, this is gonna be um, young athletes as they're you know, going into puberty. So once we get out of puberty, you start to see more of this profile, is you're gonna actually see more of a use for fat. And actually, young athletes have um, musculature that uh, promotes more like lower intensity, longer duration because they're primarily using fat for their uh, fuel source. With that being said though, when you do look at the research that is available for, um, for young athletes, we are still using carbohydrate for these types of activities as well, so we still need to balance both of them. Okay. All right, so we're going to focus on our first fuel source and we're going to talk about carbohydrate and glycogen. So as I mentioned before, Glycogen is our storage form of carbohydrate, and it gets stored in two places. It's stored in the muscle, and it's also stored in the liver. And why it's also stored in the liver is because it is the primary fuel source for our brains and our central nervous system. Um, so uh, the body likes to use glucose for this. And essentially what happens during activity is you're going to see a breakdown of these little bonds, and all these little green balls here are going to be the carbohydrate subunits of glucose or sugar that's going to fuel that energy. Okay? So we do have a storage bank of glycogen, um, uh, and uh, you have about 1,800 calories, give or, give or take, it depends on the person, um, stored as carbohydrate. And this is basically what we're going to utilize you know, at rest as well as in activity. The thing is, is as soon as we start increasing the amount of activity, we're going to break down those very quickly, and we're going to burn through our, our storage bank quite quickly quite quickly. So during really intense exercise without refilling, it can last only about two hours. So you can go through it pretty quickly. And um, if you do go through it 
and you don't have any more left and you um, do not replenish, you can experience something called hit the wall and where you literally feel like you have hit the wall. Um, and I've had quite a few people, including myself, experience this phenomenon. It's, it's not fun. It really feels like you've run into a wall and you can't go on. So one of the key things that we want to make sure is before going into any activity, and if we are, are doing activity that's quite prolonged, like greater than 60 to 90 minutes, we want to make sure that we can continuously replace this so we have enough on hand to support those activities. So how would you guys suggest we would replace and refuel our, our, our glucose stores, our glycogen stores? What are some ideas? What are some food sources of carbohydrates? Bread, exactly. What else? Pasta, yep. Anything else? Rice, exactly. All right, all excellent sources. So to refuel these stores or to provide enough to um, have them ready to go is we want to replace them with quality carbohydrates. Yes? Yeah. Is, that, is glucose different than sucrose? Mm. That is an excellent question. Yes, it is. So sucrose, it has glucose in it. It's a considered a disaccharide or two sugar molecule. But you, so what happens is when you get any sort of carbohydrate in the diet, and there's multiple, like for example, in dairy, the main carbohydrate is lactose. Um, it's gonna be broken down and it's gonna be broken down to the, the minor subunits of you know, something like glucose or what the other ones are. So you can get carbohydrate from other sources. You don't just have to eat glucose, but the um, you know, basic building block is glucose. Great question. So how we replenish is eating quality carbohydrates. So those food sources that you guys mentioned, the rice, the pasta, bread, all great food sources. Other great food sources as well are going to be fresh fruits, right? Um, dairy, as I mentioned before, and our starchy vegetables like our butternut squash, some more of our winter squashes. Um, but for the pastas, the cereals and the breads, focusing on the whole grains, our beans and legumes as well. Um, you can also get some from honey. Um, so lots of different places you can get carbohydrate. Why do you guys think I put this quality carbohydrate in there? What is a quality carbohydrate? Other than junk food. Other than junk food, yes. But why would I say other than junk food for quality? Mm -hmm. And why, why would I say that? Because, I mean, technically, you could drink a regular soda and you can get sugar from that. But why wouldn't I say choose that versus, like, a whole grade? It takes longer. The quality carbs would take longer to break down. Mm -hmm. It would give you energy over a longer period. Definitely one reason for that, for sure. What would be another reason for choosing something that? Carter. It's not a... Uh, I, it, uh, on the like, glycogen index scale, complex carbohydrates will release slower mm -hmm. and quickly with the spike your insulin. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So the, the study was from these whole plant foods which will also aid in digestion and removal of other harmful wastes. All right, so we're adding in fiber. We're also working on glycemic index and also thinking about the you know longer provision of energy. All great things. Um, also, in general, in terms of quality, you're getting more than just the carbohydrate. Okay, you're getting the fiber, you're getting the vitamins, you're getting the minerals. So, do you guys know what the difference is between like a refined grain, like let's say a white rice versus like a brown rice or a whole grain? Do you guys know what's removed when it goes through that process? So, no. What was that? The goodness. The goodness. Uh, I would definitely say yes, unless there was an enrichment process that added in some of those things. Um, really, you're stripped of a lot of the great things that are in that grain. So one of the things you mentioned was like the cellulose or like the fibrous content of those grains. So when you get like a, a refined grain, you lose that fiber because you're losing that outer shell portion of it. You also are losing out on things like vitamin E, which is in the oil part of the whole grain or other vitamins and minerals as well. So when I say quality, I mean taking a look at the whole food to be able to get that you know, nice like whole package as well. Awesome. One of these things you'll also notice with a lot of these food sources is that they might pop up in some of the other macronutrients we're going to talk about in terms of energy. Okay, so this is kind of just like a quick, uh, you know, like I said, one of the major things I want you guys to take home today is good ideas for food sources. These are just some like breaking down for carbohydrates, so some ideas for whole grains, fruit, vegetables, some cereals, um, as well as potatoes. Um, I get the question, you know, so does that mean that I can load up on french fries? Technically, fries do contain, you know, your starchy carbohydrates. Um, 
you know, the fried aspect of it, if you're thinking about in terms of fueling, might bother your stomach. So looking, you know, again at the whole meal. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about why we would stay away from some of the heavier fat food items. Not that fat is bad, but just in terms of digestion and sitting in your stomach right before an event. All right, so we're going to move on to protein next, okay? So in the beginning of this talk, I talked a lot about the fact that the young athlete is experiencing a lot of rapid growth, particularly around the time of puberty. So that's something that's very big in terms of what's going on in protein, okay? So protein needs are going to vary widely um, because there's a lot of different things that you have to take into consideration in determining protein needs. Number one is how old the athlete is and also what is their body weight. Okay. So protein needs are based on the amount of protein per kilo or pound of body weight per day. So it's going to be different from person to person. And as I mentioned before, it's going to be different. It seems like there's more protein need for a, a younger individual versus an adult. And that's just because when you get to adulthood, we've pretty much stopped growing at that point. And so the numbers are going to be more for maintaining weight versus supporting um, growth. It's the same way that if you looked at like a baby's uh, needs, you know, it can be anywhere above two grams per kilo versus what an adult's daily needs of like 0.8 grams per kilo would be. And you're like, that seems like a big difference. Babies only usually weigh like, you know, you know, how many kilos, like five kilos, six kilos, even lower kilos when they're first born versus adults that weigh like seven kilos plus, you know, around that age. All right. It's also really going to depend on the sport as well as any other activities that are going on. So if you're in high training mode and you have like, you know, three practices a week plus tournaments on the weekends, you know, plus your activities are, you know, in introducing things like, you know, not only like endurance and running and aerobic activities, but you're also doing weightlifting, that's going to also influence what your actual protein needs are to make sure that we are replacing that. Okay. So again, we're going to be focusing on some quality, and um, I meant to put this in as a delayed animation so you guys could tell me what were good protein sources, but I kind of like let the cheat sheet out here. So lots of different sources for protein. Do I have any vegetarian athletes in here? Are you a vegetarian athlete? Are you complete vegan or just vegetarian? But completely vegan, okay. Um, where do you usually go for your protein sources, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot? Uh, beans, like, mm -hmm. soy products. Supplementation protein, mm -hmm. soy protein, mm -hmm. um, and protein. Yep. And some nuts, but not much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. And can I ask what activity you do you typically do? Cycling. Cycling. All right. Oh, I'm gonna have to talk to you afterwards. My husband is a vegetarian cyclist as well. Not a full vegan. Close, but vegetarian. So, all right. So you can be an athlete who's a vegetarian or a vegan. You don't just have to get your protein sources from meat. And a lot of people, you know, do tend to go to meat. And the reason for that is um, when you look at protein quality, a lot of times it comes down to the, the basic building blocks of protein. And when you look at the basic building blocks of protein, you have these things called amino acids, and that's what protein breaks down to. And there are essential amino acids, meaning those amino acids that our bodies does, don't make enough of or don't make at all, so we have to get them from the diet and you usually can get all of those Actually, you can always get all those from meat sources so a lot of times we're like you need more protein than get meat but you can get them from you know non-meat sources as well soy in particular will have all of those essential amino acids as well as just common combinations the most classic combination in terms of getting all the essential amino acids from vegetarian combinations would be something like rice and beans pairing those together you'll get all the essential amino acids that you would need from your diet so you do not need to just eat meat um, if you want to eat meat though Definitely okay. Oh, all right. So other quality sources of protein. I know I gave you guys the cheat sheet, but look, some of these look very familiar from our <laughs> carbohydrates, beans, legumes. You can get a good source of protein as well as carbohydrates. Your dairy products as well. Um, uh, you can get them from nuts. Okay, nuts are also a source of healthy fats. We'll talk about in a second. Um, all of your different meat options, not only beef, pork, chicken, poultry. Um, turkey, as well as your um, fish, and then eggs, of course, are a great source. So lots of different areas where you can get good quality protein. Again, quality protein. I get a lot of questions about whether or not I should be taking a protein supplement. If you can get it from food, it's so much better. When you look at any of the research looking at supplement versus food forms of any of these nutrients, always better to get it in food. Performance is always better. Health in general is always better if you're getting it from food and it really has to do with something with the food matrix, kind of like the, the symbiosis of all of the nutrients working together. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I also get a lot of questions about what is a serving of protein and what does that look like? So it used to be a deck of cards. And I don't know how many people actually really use a deck of cards that much these days. Um, so I say go to uh, an iPhone 4S. I know we're a few versions out at this point. The 5S is a little too thin to be a good, sor good visual of a source of protein or for a good serving of protein. But a good serving of protein, like a three ounce serving, would be about an a iPhone 4S. And that's about 21 grams of protein. And, and that's cooked. So up here you've got your chicken, your beef, your salmon, as well as your pork. Okay, so if you start to think about, like, let's say, um, you know, you, you know you're going to need a certain amount of protein per day, let's say, like, it's 65 grams, then you know that really eating, like, three and a little bit more of these is going to meet your basic needs. Yes? What would that be in, like, okay, well, three, one, six, so it just seems rather small. It is very small, and that's the thing is a lot of times we eat plenty of protein. And, with, and even though we might have an increased need as an athlete or even an increased need, let's say that you have it for, you know, a, a major surgery or healing or something going on, more often than not, we're eating plenty. Like the recommendation for just the average adult is only 0.8 grams per day. The average adult probably eats over one gram per kilo per day. So it's usually not an issue to have to really focus on increasing your protein amount. Where it becomes an issue is if overall we're just not eating enough, or you need to be very careful with what your protein sources are if you're following a strict diet like being vegan and making sure you're just including the right sources to get enough in there. But it's a great question. It's the serving sizes are, are pretty small to get the amount that you need. Any questions so far? All right, moving on to our nice list of things to have on hand in your cup cabinets. So fish, if you like tuna, if you like salmon, all great sources of protein are beans and legumes, lean beef, pork, one ground, bowl, poultry, frozen or can is fine, eggs, eggs whites. Eggs come up because if you like egg whites, that's where you're going to get the protein from the egg anyways. Um, I say low-fat dairy, again, not because fat is bad, but we're going to start thinking about when we're going to include these in and if it's going to be sitting around in your stomach or not. And then, of course, soy as well. If you're not a soy fan and you want to get protein in different sources that are plant-based, um, you can do the you know gluten, wheat gluten form. If you wanted to do like seitan, um, uh, Carter had mentioned hemp protein as well. I have some vegan athletes that have also done like pea protein. Um, so there's a lot of different options for that as well. Um, uh, other good sources that are kind of grain products with protein. I know that quinoa technically is a seed, not necessarily a grain, but cooks like a grain, um, is uh, also contains all the essential amino acids if anybody eats quinoa in, in here. All right, so moving on to our last macro or big nutrient that's going to provide um, energy, and that's going to be fat. So um, we have two fats that we need, or fatty acids that we need from the diet. We need our omega-3s and our omega-6s. And does anybody know what a good food source for omega-3s is in, or something they've heard where you can get good omega-3s? Anybody? Yes, fish is one of them, yes. Fish is where most people get omega-3s. If you were a strict vegan, where would you get omega-3s? Flaxseed oil, flaxseed meal. What? <coughs> mm -hmm. Different nuts, especially walnuts. Mm -hmm. For sure. What about omega-6s? Where would you get omega-6s from? Our vegetable oils. What was that? Uh, almond butter has more saturated fat. Almond butter still has some uh, monounsaturated fat. You're get, getting close, and we're going to talk about those different fats in just a second. But a lot of your other vegetable oils will give you your omega 6s. So these are going to be your two nutrients of the fats that we have to get in the diet because our body just doesn't make enough. Yeah. That is a great question. It does not include coconut oil. Coconut oil is not an essential fat. And we're going to talk, we can talk about coconut oil in just a second because it's a, a great question, something that's brought up a lot. Yes? I heard that farm-raised fish doesn't have That is a great question. Some of them, no, do not have omega-3s. And that's one of those things that when you're looking at where your food is coming from, to read the label and ask those questions, especially if you're getting them at like the farmer's market, um, and they can let you know. And the reason for that is um, you're going to get those fats um, from like the environment um, and such, and what the, the fish are you know eating and feeding upon. And so if that's not you know there, then they're not going to be able to 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 have that within their their flesh. So. 
It's the same way that, like, if you look at the commercials for, like, Eggland's Best Eggs, like, typically you wouldn't necessarily see, like, omega-3s in eggs all the time, but the chickens that are, are laying these eggs with omega-3s, their feed has omega-3s in them, so they're taking them up, and that's what's being produced in their eggs. Um, so um, other healthful fats besides just our omega-3s and omega-6s, and, and actually let me back up really quick. Um, why these are also really important in terms of athletics, I wanted to say before we move on. So omega-3s and omega-6s are involved in two big pathways for us. Omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory, okay? and omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. So we want to make sure that we have a balance of both. When we are physically active, very physically active, we actually cause a little bit of inflammation in our bodies because we are, you know, causing activity, we're putting a little stress on the body. And that's okay. And that's also okay, especially if we have like an injury, we want to make sure that, you know, we have those pro-inflammatory markers that say, hey, there's an injury. We need to like set forth like all those mediators to like help heal that injury. But we don't want to be pro-inflammatory all the time. So that's why the omega-3s are great to be able to be anti-inflammatory to keep it in check. And so when um, we are physically active and let's say that we are, you know, causing a little, let's say, oxidative stress, especially, you know, breaking down some of those cell membranes and such because of our activity, we want to make sure we have enough in there to kind of curb that and like rebuild those cell membranes because our fat is really what is lining a lot of our cell membranes and keeping things fluid and healthy. Okay. So there are other fats out there as well. Um, Carter had mentioned monounsaturated fats, and there's also polyunsaturated fats, and there's saturated fats versus unsaturated. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Actually, I think it's our next slide coming up. It is. Okay. So what fat should I eat? What have you guys heard in terms of what, what should I eat and what I shouldn't eat? He's going to talk get into our different types of fats. We could actually have a conversation for like two of these sessions on fats, but we're going to only have a small bit today. Yes. Yes to avocados, no potato chips. Okay. <laughs> Why yes to avocados and no to potato <coughs> chips? Uh, potato chips are greasy and that, that's saturated fat. Could be, yes. Yeah. They, if they used a saturated fat base. So, and what's the difference between a saturated fat base and something from avocado, which would be like a monounsaturated fat base? Do you know? I don't know. That's okay. Does anybody else know? Okay, so what the difference is, is that the mono or the unsaturated fats, when it comes down to things, if you look at it from a chemical perspective, all it means is that there's a double bond present. So those that are like more liquid at room temperature, although the, the avocado is a little different, it's more solid at room temperature. Same with like fish oil, which would be more solid. Fish, not fish oil, is solid at room temperature. Um, those are the unsaturated fats. And those are the ones that are associated more with more positive health respects, especially in terms of um, cardiovascular or heart disease. The more solid at room temperature fats are those that are saturated, meaning that there's no double bonds. Um, those are the ones that it, eat in excess, in excess over a long period of time. We can eat saturated fat, it's just fine. Um, those are the ones that have been associated with more of an increased risk for heart disease. Um, so when we're looking in terms of like which ones to eat more often versus less often, you know, when you eat the things that have nut, that are nuts, avocado, fish, olive oil, peanut butter, those are the ones that are going to contain those, you know, less solid at room temperature. <coughs> fats that have more of the healthy proponents and are going to have more of those anti-inflammatory, you know, good balance effects, okay, versus the choosing the less often, which are more solid at room temperature, and things that contain um, another type of fat called trans fat or uh, hydrogenated oils. And anything that says trans, just a side note really quick, anything on the label that says trans fat free, and you flip it over and you actually read the ingredients and it says partially hydrogenated whatever oil, that food does still contain trans fat in it. When it says trans fat free, all that means is that only up to, they're, they're allowed to have up to a half a gram of fat per serving um, of trans fat for it to be able to say trans fat free. So if you are trying to minimize your trans fats, look at the ingredients label because you'll see firsthand if there's actually trans fat in there. And a lot of times, like when we look at what the serving size is, you might be eating double or triple of that. So for sure you would be getting, you know, more than a half a gram per serving. Um, so trans fats, you know, not as much anymore do you see in the margarine, but in a lot of our, our you know, shelf stable items because it's a very stable fat. Fried food, so the oil that's introduced, <laughs> really high heat will create trans fats. Okay, um, a lot of your creamy sauces, chips, full fat, dairy have saturated fat as well in them. And again, 
Eating full fat dairy is fine if you want to. Um, again, in moderation is always key. But one of the things with fat in general is that it does take a little longer to digest than the rest of the macronutrients, particularly if we want to think about um, in terms of right before a, a workout. So we don't want to have it sitting around in our stomach because it usually makes us not feel so great. So um, and you had the question about coconut oil. So coconut oil is something that has come up a lot recently because it is primarily saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. Um, but a lot of the research around it right now is taking a look to see like if it's because it comes from a plant-based source versus an animal-based source. You know, is there any difference in that? And um, I know that the research is pretty preliminary, but of the, I guess, long-standing trials right now, because it's still a saturated fat, it kind of rides that like, okay, we still want to make sure that we're eating it in you know, somewhat moderation, but you know, it's still kind of TBD in terms of like long-term health effects. So if you use it, it's fine, you know, make sure in moderation. I mean, people ask me like, you know, when you bake, do you cut out everything? You know, I don't bake all the time, but when I do bake, I use butter. So, um, and that's because, you know, it's a special treat. I'm not eating it every single day, but um, you know, it's again about the balance. I'm also not the type of person that says you need to take anything completely out of your diet. Usually you can make anything work. So, any other questions on fats or the other nutrients that give us uh, energy before we move on to hydration? You guys are good. All right. Okay, so moving on to hydration and fluid basics. So as I mentioned earlier on, especially as we start to migrate maybe through the tunnel or um, on the other side, maybe 685 or even more like Central Valley-ish, it can get really, really hot. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are avoiding um, dehydration. And also sometimes throughout the day, drinking is just not necessarily a priority. We're busy, we're in school, we've got, you know, we got homework to do, we've got to get to practice and such like that. So sometimes hydration can take a backseat. So it's important to make sure though that we are keeping ourselves hydrated. So a lot of times when I talk to my athletes who maybe are experiencing things like muscle cramps or just really fatigued and out of it, we start talking about identifying the specific signs and symptoms of dehydration and to let, make sure that you're more in tune with your body because some of these are pretty nonspecific, especially if you are in a sport where it is already hot and it is already like you're going to be tired because you've been out there, you know, you're on the court, what have you. Okay, so being tired, loss of appetite, nausea, poor concentration, flushed skin, or lightheadedness, a lot of these are pretty non-specific. You're like, yeah, I feel that way anyways after like a good hard two-hour practice or two-hour ride, right? So you know, but if you feel more tired than normal and you didn't, you you know, you've gone on the same run or the same ride that you always have, and you like weren't drinking, okay? So one of the key things I say is to say, start taking a look at what your urine looks like. And I always get the weird like eyes of like, mm, why do I really want to take a look at my pee? Well, you know, our bodies are really good at holding on to the fluid that we need. Um, and so if your pee is really, really dark, that means that your body is really trying to conserve and hold on to as much fluid as possible. So what's going to end up in the toilet is going to be much more concentrated because that's the solutes that are coming out. The same way that if your, your pee was pretty much just like clear, and that means that you're very well hydrated, maybe somewhat too hydrated because you're just peeing off extra water. So you really want to aim for like a pale yellow urine color, and that's a pretty good balance. Okay. And as I mentioned before, some of my athletes that have muscle cramps, um, it has been shown that uh, athletes that are dehydrated, that you might experience muscle cramps because your muscles can't fully contract as well, and so you get a cramping effect. Okay. So, moving on to here. So, what do we use for fluids, or how do we even think about fluid replacement? This is again very individual because it really depends on the activity and the environment in which you are participating in this activity. Okay, so typically the guideline is replace losses from sweat and other losses. Okay, so this is very difficult, and I actually just was recently doing a lot of reading on this and looking at fluid losses in like soccer players versus like ice hockey players, um, especially since those are two completely different environments, right? You can be playing in like the dead heat of summer in soccer and really be working up a sweat. And then when you're in the, ice, you know, in the ice rink, you're like, okay, but it's ice cold, right? It's freezing there. Well, with all that extra heavy equipment and stuff, you could also be actively losing a lot of sweat. The same thing that's also really difficult is that if you're in the pool and you're a swimmer, how do you even assess whether or not you've been sweating because you're in the pool and you're wet? How would you do that? Well, I don't know, but I, I think of like skiing. Mm -hmm. You're in the cold, mm -hmm. in the snow, and it's really aspiration. Yep. You're breathing. Mm -hmm. You're losing it because you're breathing Breathe. out the 
moisture. Exactly. And, and you have to drink extra when you're up there, even if you're not exerting yourself. Right. Right. Or you will. For myself, I'll get a headache. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, you know, that's for me the best sign. It's like if I get a headache, then I probably I need to drink a glass of water. Often it goes away. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And that, and, and that actually is huge because that's you being much more like and knowing what's in tune with your body and when you know your dehydration and stuff. And that's very difficult for people to know and be more in tune to. So really knowing you and also knowing if you're a heavy sweater or not a heavy sweater. The other thing too is that what happens is as you become more conditioned, even though you may be sweating and losing some fluid, um, you may become more efficient at not losing as much fluid or as losing as much sodium. And we're going to talk about sodium next um, in your fluid so because one of the other things not only is hydration an issue but also starting to think about the electrolytes that you might be losing in that fluid when you're sweating and keeping that in balance we're going to talk about that in the the, the next couple of slides so um, really what it comes down to is um, when I'm talking with my athletes is what is the activity that they're doing you know letting them start to think about like the signs and symptoms that they know that they're hydrated or not hydrated enough. For the swimmers, sometimes they do the weighing themselves before they get in the pool and then having their workout, getting out and weighing themselves after they get out of the pool. And then you can see actually how much fluid is lost. And my husband actually did this when he was off season from cycling and he was doing some swim for cross training. And he was like, I was amazed that I lost a couple pounds and I didn't even think I was out there doing that much. I just was swimming laps for like, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And he was like, I actually like had really lost a lot. So um, he was like, and I, you know, was tired afterwards, but I thought it was just because I hadn't been in the pool that long and it had been a while. So um, really, again, keying into those things. So I mentioned, again, watching our urine. So aiming for pale yellow urine color. You know, give or take about five full bladders of urine daily is what you can see. Um, some people, it's not that much. And also with some people, they, they don't have the schedule to be able to go to the bathroom that many times during the day. So again, keeping that in mind as well. Um, fluid choices that are out there. There's a lot of fluid choices out there. Water is by far my favorite um, and by far the one that I would recommend. Um, there's a lot of sports drinks that are out there as well and we're going to talk about why we even have sports drinks, should we be drinking sports drinks, when they're appropriate, when they're not. Um, some people use juices, especially if they have blood sugar issues and they need to also increase their blood sugar like the type 1 diabetes. And then I get questions like, oh, should I drink coffee drinks because caffeine can help me with my performance, right? So we're going to talk about all those in just a second. All right, so we're going to go to our my age-old question that I get a lot is, should we be drinking water or sports drinks? What do you guys think? What was that? Water is a great one. What about if we start, yeah. You can put like, like this little pellets, and some of them are mm -hmm. low For myself, I watch sugars. Mm -hmm. You can get low sugar ones, and they yep. just give you the, the electrolytes. But the Gatorade, I think, is too sugary. Mm -hmm. And that is great that you guys like brought that so up. Fun. Right. So, um, so we, we've been talking about electrolytes a lot. So what are electrolytes? What do you guys know about electrolytes? What they are, what they do? Sodium and potassium. Yes, those are our two big ones that we talk about a lot. And okay, so what do those electrolytes do? What do sodium and potassium do? They do. Wow, are you taking like hardcore biology right now? Or oh, nice. I was like, man, you're on it. Um, yes. Yeah, so they do. They create on an ion gradient. So electrolytes, they have a charge to them. And when they create this ion gradient, what do they do? Not to to poke your brain again. Did you just take your? Great. Perfect. So for our, our online guests, I don't know if you can hear Carter all the way out there, but um, basically he just it explained a, a great explanation of electrolytes. Did you just take your AP Bio exam? Yeah, I remember taking that way back when. Um, so uh, with with electrolytes, basically what happens is they do carry a charge and they create this ion potential um, so that you get this, carry this charge in between um, and why that's important in terms of uh, athletics and movement in general is that it helps with contraction, okay? And it's also things like not only for athletics, but if you think about like your heartbeat, okay? Your heartbeat is a contraction. You need that gradient, that potential to go back and forth, okay? 
<clears throat> so um, one of the things you want to worry about is if you're losing too much sodium or potassium, sodium is usually more of the issue in terms of uh, sweating because it's consider it's uh, located extracellularly or outside of the cell, so you see more of a loss of that versus potassium. But when you lose it, um, you lose that, that gradient, that, that potential. So you want to make sure that if you are excessively sweating out um, or losing it in other ways, like let's say that you vomit or have really bad diarrhea, um, that you want to replace it. Um, one of the things I always think about when um, just even working in the hospital is that a lot of times when my kids are throwing up or having diarrhea or even like outside, um, you might have something like Pedialyte and basically Pedialyte has electrolytes to replace for those losses. All right, so why I've been talking about electrolytes is because sports drinks um, were created essentially to be able to provide that. But sports drinks have um, quite a lot of sugar in them as well. And that is something that we'll talk about like if we actually need that. So looking at sports drinks and, and, and uh, water. So number one, both really do provide an excellent source of fluid. So they are both fluid based, okay? And you can use them for dirt before, during, and after workouts. Sports drinks are a package that you can have electrolytes and they also can have carbs in the form of sugar. And that can really help during and after intense exercise. So we're gonna talk about intense exercise. That would be like way greater than like an hour, an hour and a half plus. If you just really need the electrolyte because you are a heavy sweater, you can do things um, that were mentioned. What was your name again? Mike. Mike. What Mike mentioned is that you can actually get tablets that have just electrolytes in them. Again, if you are really actively losing them that are low carb or no carb, meaning there's no extra sugar added to them. Um, you know, I know some athletes that have used Noon. I actually had um, a, a, a Cal swimmer come up to me and talk to me about using just actually mixing in Pedialyte, Pedialyte into his water having some just to replace the electrolytes. So you can do that as well. Um, if you are, let's say, doing some like endurance cycling, um, you're doing those, you know, three, four hour plus bike rides, you're doing marathons, you might want to think about using the sport drink because you might actually need that carbohydrate in there, especially if your stomach can't really handle something more solid, uh, to be able to replace those glycogen stores and give you a carbohydrate source as you're feeling through exercise. But again, intense exercise where you would actually need it. More often than not, water is just fine. All right, what about energy drinks that have that nice high amount of caffeine? Definitely want to avoid use during workouts. A lot of those energy drinks, and I'm thinking like the monsters and stuff like that, the caffeine content's way too high. Um, also, um, it's uh, very sugary and sometimes can be more dehydrating than it actually can be hydrating with the amount of stuff that's in there. So I would say, I would avoid all energy drinks. And also, if you're going to do caffeine content, I sometimes get what about coffee drinks like the bottled frappuccinos and such. More often than not, those have a lot of extra milk and sugar in them as well that you really don't need and you can get just fine through like water. All right, so here's our nice uh, profile of our, uh, our sports drinks and why they were even you know, created. The other thing about sports drinks too is um, if anybody has ever noticed when they have drink, they have uh, consumed a sports drink is that you never really feel fully satisfied and so you like want to drink more and that is because they are made that way so it reminds you to continue to drink. And I have sometimes a lot of people that tell me they just don't like to taste of water and they need something different. And so that's why they would drink a sports drink because it actually tastes different and tastes you know, better than water. Um, again though, let's look at the activity, what you really need to replace and do you really need it. Um, and I know that on high school campuses, there's a ton of, you know, those vending machines that have, um, you know, sports drinks in there and they want you to consume them. Um, and if you really don't need them, then you don't really need to consume them. All right, so let's move on now to uh, timing and what to do before you're going to play or compete or what have you. All right, so rule of thumb, eating one to four hours before. I know that is a very big span, but that is because we all have very different schedules and sometimes you can't eat that close to when we're going to be you know, participating in practices or participating in events. So when we talk about eating one, uh, one to four hours before, we're gonna talk about what are we going to include in those higher carb, lower fat, moderate protein items. And that is because your higher carbs you were gonna you know, digest and absorb much more quicker than what we we're gonna do with fat. We don't want the fat hanging around. Why I say lower fat is you can have a little bit of fat, especially as you're starting to get further out there um, in terms of you know when you're eating before a workout and your body has time to actually fully like process those food items. Rule of thumb for carbohydrates is you would do one gram per kilogram of body weight per hour. So if it's one hour before, one gram per kilo. Two hours before, two grams per kilo. 
Okay, looking at again moderate protein, again that has to do more with the digestibility of the food, so things that are milk by sandwich. A lot of these things also are going to be very individual specific. I have some athletes that tell me like, oh, I can have a full sandwich, no problem, you know, 45 minutes before it doesn't bother me at all, I don't get a stomach ache. Right, well, if that works for you, then that works for you, um, and that's okay. Again, very individual. The biggest thing, though, is trying these things out at practice so that comes time for your events. You don't try something new and you're like, oh, God, that did not work out well. The classic story I have is if anybody's ever um, run, like, you know, a 10K event or a half marathon event, this came up with some of my um, – you know, uh, adult athletes, they've done like the Nike women's marathon or half marathon. And do you, do you remember the, uh, the Kaiser orange station where they like give out the oranges, Chrissy? Yes. So I had, you know, people that were like, Oh, you know, um, I'm hung, you know, I'm, I'm not thirsty, but I feel like I need something. Oranges have carbohydrates in them. I'll try them. Well, you know, never trying an orange slice to have in the middle of a race at any of their workouts didn't end very well. It caused a lot of GI distress because, you know, there's something new. And um, that's never fun to experience when you're trying to perform your best at an event. So, again, sticking with your favorites and sticking with what you've been practicing with and working with during all of your training is key. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so post-workout and event eating goals, all right? So as important as before to make sure that we have enough energy fluids on board, you want to make sure that we're getting enough post-workout as well, okay? So biggest thing is muscle recovery. Um, you need carb and protein, okay? Carb definitely, protein definitely. And the biggest thing, though, is making sure that you get that in pretty much right away. Most receptive within the first hour, best if within the first 30 minutes. For sure, you know, within two hours. But really, really, really within the first hour, 30 minutes if you can do it. I do have some athletes that tell me they just can't handle any food afterward. And they get a really bad stomach ache and they can really do minimal, minimal. So we start talking about the different types of food. Sometimes drinking is better than eating. So we'll do a, you know, a drinking. <laughs> carb protein thing like chocolate milk is a big one for example um, or we'll do something like why don't we do some saltine crackers to settle your stomach and then maybe introduce something like a banana with you know peanut butter or something okay so the biggest thing again is thinking about our quality protein sources for that muscle repair um, why it's most important is when you look at the research again mostly in adults some in like the older adolescents you see um, you definitely see uh, muscle recovery and muscle memory and uh, the most when you introduce that early on. And then I always get the question of like, what about that like, you know, ideal carb to protein ratio that I should be like aiming for? And when you look at the, the research that that I ideal ratio, and I say ideal ratio lightly is because really it's just what's been like tested most commonly in the research is usually you see either like a three part carb to one point, uh, one part protein or a four point Four, excuse me, four part carb to one part protein. And that's just really when you get down to the nitty gritty of like the grams. What's the best example of that I've seen in the research? And actually just read a recent paper looking at adolescent boys um, and uh, chocolate milk uh, consumption after a workout. Um, that is a, a good example of when you like look at the math of the protein to the carbohydrate that it's three part carbohydrates to one part protein. Okay. Lots of different options out there for post-meal recovery. If you like a sandwich, perfect. If you like chocolate milk, that's fine. If you're somebody that can barely do anything, you can do some fruit, that's okay too. Again, just making sure that you um, can provide both of those. All right, so I know that we're getting ready to wrap up soon because we had a uh, um, we got a little, starting a little bit late, but I just wanted to bring up some other topics that come up in my practice and questions that I get offhand. Um, you know, a lot of times I get like, okay, well, this is great that you have all this general information. What about sports specific information? So this is just a very, very brief rundown of like thinking about if you group the different types of sports. So things like, you know, our endurance athletics, what are we going to be taking a look at? That means activity that's going to last longer than an hour. Really thinking about, you know, the fact are we going through the glycogen content of our muscles? You know, do we need to start introducing more fat? You know, yes, no. Okay, strength and speed athletics, you know, repeated bouts of high intensity exercise lasting from a few seconds to three minutes. Again, if you remember from the beginning of our talk, thinking about where 
where that energy source is coming from. Do I need to be replenishing as much, you know, as if I were doing like an hour plus run or a cycling event or even playing in a soccer game or a basketball game. Um, other things that come up, image weight class athletics, really taking a look at weight control practices. You know, how are we, are, how are we or are we trying to lose weight to make that weight class for wrestling? You know, are there any disordered eating patterns going on to be able to make that specific weight and being able to hopefully, you know, correct those to keep everything in balance. Um, and then the majority of my athletes that I meet with are from a team sports background. So really taking a look at the, you know, team sports aspect of, you know, a soccer, a basketball, a volleyball, a baseball, you know, is there really repeated, you know, what is the repeated high intensity intermittent efforts? How do we balance both maybe the endurance of like a two hour event versus, you know, also like the quick sprints that are going on in between and really taking a look at the diet as a whole, not just around the specific um, activities and what like food components we need to support those. All right. I also get questions. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. yes. What about? Uh, Go back to um, this. Cross country mm. high school. Yeah. High school cross country and track mm -hmm. running a mile or two. Right, exactly. So um, the, depending on the event, so um, I know for cross country, sometimes it can last. Yeah, I was going to say, <coughs> yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily always fall into the endurance athletics in terms of the event, but the training might. So, again, balancing the training versus the actual event and, like, talking about the specific feeling on event days versus training days. Um, and then for the track, the same thing. It really depends on what the um, actual event is. And I just met with, um, I just gave a talk to the Head Roy School, to their track and field team, and we talked about the, you know, overall general picture of the diet. But they all told me, you know, not they may only be doing, you know, long jump, high jump, but yet they're still cross training and doing all the running and the sprinting yeah. as well to keep condition. And so, you know, what, you know, their diet would still need to incorporate all those things to feel for practice. So that's an excellent question. Okay, so ergogenic aids and supplements, because I get some questions about these at all. What actually are they? Basically, they're just substances that would be used to enhance athletic performance. So um, in terms of pediatrics and, and, and our youth athletics, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has a policy statement out on the use of performance enhancing agents, and they condemn their use in, in um in our young athletes. So you really should not be using them. But there's sometimes like a gray definition of what is an ergogenic aid. Okay? So the big things that I, I see a lot in the more of the adults are using things like the creatine powder or ephedra. Um, I don't really see those as much in my youth athletics and my, my youth athletes. But what about things like sports drinks? So technically they're like, you know, packaged for, you know, perform, you know, in, to enhance your performance. What about energy bars? Should you be eating energy bars or protein bars? Like, are Cliff bars not okay then? And what about like gels? For some of my, you know, my cross country runners, they'll say that they have like shot blocks and stuff to eat on the run because they're easy on the stomach. So what about all those things? And those are really like a case by case thing. For a lot of the energy bars, there's so many out there. It's the same thing of like almost like you know a hyped up granola bar. Really, what I would say about these is read the label. Take a look at the ingredients. You know, keep the same rules that you're going to be applying for normal food um, to if you're really going to include one of these things as well. If you like these and these, these work for you, then that's fine. But, you know, things like 20 grams of protein right before, uh, you know, a sprint workout might not be the best idea. So you might want to say think about this in terms of, like, you know, much earlier on. Um, I know, like, for myself and my husband, sometimes if, like, we have a workout in, like, two hours when we're at work, maybe we'll have, you know, a piece of fruit as well as something like a you know, a cliff bar because we have a little bit of time to digest those things out. The other thing is, is that if you are someone who is a vegan or vegetarian athlete, sometimes there could be traces of animal products in here, and so you really do need to read the label to make sure that they are okay. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to give an example of an energy gel profile because I get questions about, like, they're all so different. Should I be using them? And again, it's very individual specific. Um, really, these ones come up for my really big endurance athletes. I don't know, do you use these, Carter, at all in, in your cycling? And that's where I see it most is for my cyclists and my, my, long, my long, long distance runners, like my trail runners. Okay? And this is just kind of a brief uh, profile of like how many calories you would get in them, how many grams of carbohydrate, usually no fat and protein because, again, really used for during those activities. So you don't want that sitting around in your stomach. But, again, reading the label because a lot of them might contain other things like vitamins, extra electrolytes, as well as 
caffeine. And if you're not used to, especially the caffeine in the middle of a workout or just in general, it can really affect you much differently than others. Okay. All right. So just a last couple of slides on just some big things. Performance eating off-site because a lot of times we're not competing just at our school or in our hometown. So what do we do in this situation? We're going to apply the same rules that you would be applying at home. Planning ahead. Okay. What does your body need? Is it a tournament where you're going to be staying overnight somewhere that has a fridge? pack those foods that you know work for you, okay? If you're going up, this always happened to me, I'm, I'm originally from Rockland, so not too, too, too far from here, but whenever we went up to like Auburn, I mean, it's much more populated in Auburn now, my parents live up there, but there was like three restaurants that you could go to. There was like, um, I think it was like Carl's Jr., a Labu, and like a pizza place, and it was like, okay, if this is where it's gonna be dinner before our game, like our night game, what am I going to eat? So, you know, now what's nice, because again, back in the day uh, in high school, not everybody had uh, menu information up on the internet. Uh, so on the web, <laughs> you can get nutrition information for any and all of the uh, restaurants out there. But again, sticking to the same things that you would do um, when you were at home and not forgetting the fluids and thinking about your quality of fluids as well. And finally, because again, I'm a foodie. Okay, thinking about some things that might be good for your snacks, because again, if you're in school all day, you're not going to be having going home and cooking a full meal. You might be running from class straight to practice. Just some ideas for good, um, you know, foods to have that you can pack in the bag. You know, things that might hold up well: fruit, dried fruit, crackers, fruit. You can get those nice like pear packers, banana packer things these days, so that it's not getting all smushed up in there. Um, you know, fluids, water, or sport drink, depending on what your activity is. Protein, any good, pro you know, travel sandwiches that are going to hold up well, hard-boiled eggs, if you are going to do a protein granola bar, um, string cheese, yogurts, those sorts of things, you can put an ice pack in there. So um, all ideas of what you can use. There's obviously plenty more out there. I think in the handout that's out in, in the back, there's some ideas in there as well um, for just good, good things to try. And um, that is it for this evening. Do I have any questions from those in the audience first? And then we can jump online and see if I have some questions from those that are online. Yes. I have um, a stress fracture in my leg. Mm -hmm. you know, like boots. Yeah. In terms of like healing. Mm -hmm. That is a great question. So, um, uh, first of all, are how limited are you in your activities right now? Um, like I can run and I have this, but I probably shouldn't be. <laughs> but like I rested mm -hmm. for six weeks. Okay. But, like, Okay. All right. So it's still there. It's still causing you some pain. Um, in terms of healing needs, I mean, number one, first and foremost, of course, we, we think about, you know, protein needs are always good. So making sure you're getting adequate protein. Also, um, getting enough of your micronutrients, so your vitamins and minerals. So if you're eating, you know, good protein sources plus your veggies and fruit, um, you're in a good place. But you, I don't think that you really need to take any sort of, like, supplement for that. Like calcium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Calcium and vitamin D for bone is, is definitely important. Do you do you take a, any supplements like a multivitamin or anything yeah, I'm right taking now? The calcium supplement. Okay. What were you taking for your calcium supplement? Who am I asking? Okay. So one of the things I would recommend if you're taking the calcium is also pairing it with the, the vitamin D because they work hand in hand in terms of bone health. Um, and vitamin D, if you if you're going to try to get it through food form, it's a little bit more difficult because there's such a minimum amount of food sources. Um, so you can get it through fortified milk. You can get it through salmon. Um, you can get it through um, some mushrooms if they're exposed to light while they were growing. Um, and uh, the other thing is, oh goodness, I can't think. I think it was uh, eggs if like the it was included in the 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 feed of the chickens, but a lot of people mostly get their um, vitamin D through sun exposure of the skin. Right now, it's really not the best time for that with like the overcastness of the Bay Area. So a supplement might be okay. Any other questions from the audience? No. All right, what about our online questions that we have? So we've got one question. May we get a power, excuse me, I may get a copy of the PowerPoint. And um, let me double check on that. I believe that is okay. As long as it's yeah. okay with you, I've put my email address there. They're oh. welcome to contact me for that. Perfect, perfect. So, yes, you can get a copy of this PowerPoint. Um, you can contact Chrissy at her email listed below. Any other questions or any online questions? 
All right, then I think that is a wrap. Um, it was really great being here to speak tonight. Thank you, everybody, who joined us online as well as my in live, my live audio or live <laughs> studio here. Um, if you guys have any questions or are interested in the clinics that we have here or the outreach that we do here, you can um, talk to me afterwards or contact Chrissy, and she can put you in contact with me as well. So thanks all for being here tonight. Thank you.